Yeah, I was just thinking it's especially fun to be here at the seminar. I think I used to help organize this seminar back in 2014. Um, so it's nice to be back. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to be sharing um, some of my work today, um, specifically three studies uh, from some of my PhD thesis work. Uh, but before I dive into that, I'm just going to give some some broader context uh, for uh, all of the, the things that I do in my work. Um, so I want to start by unpacking some of the terms in that really long title. Uh, the first one being marginalization. Uh, so the definition of marginalization that I use is that it is a dynamic process where people are removed from the center and are pushed to the periphery of a dominant social group. And this happens through the designation of power and resources and importance. It tells us who is being prioritized in a given space. And very often marginalization happens along lines of identity. Uh, so some of the protected class identities are on the screen, things like gender and race, citizenship, language, body. Uh, and our relationship with marginalization and privilege is context dependent. Uh, so everyone who's here in this virtual space together likely experiences different contexts of both marginalization and privilege. And these things can change over time. They can change over the course of your life. Uh, or they can also change over the course of the day, depending on what context you are entering into. And the intersectional nature of identity means that the unique combinations of identity uh, that we occupy uh, give rise to unique experiences. And one particular context of marginalization is technology. Uh, in some uh, descriptions of technology, we were sort of given this promise of equity and objectivity and instead, many of us are likely familiar with some of these headlines on the screen, uh, the countless stories of the ways that technology differentially affects and treats people from minority groups. Uh, it is the status quo for technology to embed, enact, and perpetuate marginalization. And one of the consequences of that marginalization is uncertainty. Again, uncertainty is something that we all experience. Uh, but overwhelming uncertainty can be incredibly harmful uh, to mental and even physical well-being. Marginalization tends to increase the uh, magnitude of the uncertainty we experience. It means that there are more regular and frequent experiences uh, with uncertainty uh, in specific instances. So, for example, uh, when you take something like a standardized test, you might have uncertainty about your ability to remember the content or to perform well. Uh, but you might have additional burdens that marginalization might place on you, like, am I representing my group well? And what will be the consequences of my poor performance uh, for other people who might belong to the same group as myself? Marginalization also increases the frequency um, of uncertainty uh, through unique experiences, such as those with things like persistent bias, racism, sexism, other forms of prejudice. Uh, and these are embedded sort of in, in our everyday context in our everyday lives. And finally, part of what makes all of this so insidious is that it is cumulative. Uh, when we have marginalizing experiences, those negative impacts build over time uh, to create, again, uh, mental and emotional burdens, physical burdens, and practical burdens uh, to well-being. Uh, so all of this taken together presents some really interesting and exciting opportunities to investigate uh, for research. Uh, specifically, uh, we can understand and dive deeper into the ways that marginalization amplifies uncertainty. So we know that it does that. We don't know a lot about those specific mechanics. Uh, we can look at the influence of social technology and understand how might it help in these situations and how might it be harmful. Uh, and we can investigate how we can design uh, for better situations of empowerment in coping with or reducing uh, that uncertainty that might be causing harm. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, three studies over the course of a uh, several years long project investigating a specific instance of marginalization and uncertainty uh, through the CARE project. Uh, the CARE project looks at interpersonal racism as a specific instantiation of marginalization. Uh, so I'm going to walk through three studies that um, demonstrate qualitative and storytelling methodology, as well as participatory design and game design as approaches towards addressing marginalization and empowerment. So the very first study, uh, I began by looking at best practice in this space. Uh, so for the remainder of the talk, I just want to provide a brief content warning. Uh, 
all of the research I'm going to talk about deals with interpersonal racism, which is, of course, a personal and a sensitive topic. Uh, so I just encourage you um, to take care of your own needs first while you're in this space. If you need to step away for a bit and come back or um, pause and, and return, um, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, so some additional context uh, for that phrase I used, interpersonal racism. Uh, so what I mean by that is uh, experiences of racism that happen between individuals or groups of individuals. Uh, so that specific focus was necessary because there's just so little uh, research in this space and I wanted to get as uh, concrete as possible. Um, but it's important to understand that definition in the context of a larger framework of oppression. Um, so some other uh, forms of oppression include ideo ideological, uh, institutional, and internalized. Uh, and throughout the research, you'll see how it's really hard to uh, separate all of these concerns. Uh, so I'll be sharing some stories from participants later on, and you can see how these different forms will touch on the work, even while I'm mostly having a conversation about what interpersonal racism looks like and how we can cope with that. Uh, so to give some additional background, in my research, I use uh, critical race theory as a framing. And critical race theory tells us that racism is an everyday experience. We can't treat it like it's a special thing that only happens when we encounter overt bigotry. Instead, modern racism is subtle. It's embedded in our everyday context, and it can be unintended while still being incredibly harmful. And that subtle nature of modern racism, not knowing whether it was intended um, or if it actually happened, means that uncertainty is often at the core of experiencing racism. Uh, and finally, as with other forms of marginalization and uncertainty, experiencing racism frequently causes long-term harm to mental, emotional, and physical well-being. It can cause hypertension, long-term damage to heart health, as well as chronic anxiety, uh, amongst a, a host of other negative outcomes. So this is something that's affecting people in a very real way on a daily basis, whether or not they're experiencing overt forms of racism. And while it's necessary to combat racism and to engage in anti-racist practice, acknowledging that it's pervasive means we also need to devote time and attention to the ways that we can cope with and mitigate those negative impacts. Uh, we're not going to get rid of this tomorrow. We need to make sure we're also supporting people right now, today. Um, so uh, part of the reason why it's so uh, challenging to deal with racism is because while social support is known to be one of the best ways of coping with racism, discussing racism is incredibly difficult, right? It requires us to be incredibly vulnerable, uh, to speak about experiences that are potentially traumatic. You have to find the right person to speak to, someone who's actually going to provide uh, the support that helps, that is necessary. Uh, and when we look at the social tools that might facilitate that social support, uh, we find that they, again, amplify a lot of the things that technology is already amplifying when it comes to racial disparity, specifically online spaces where you might go to seek social support entail specific risks of harassment and hate speech when you are someone from a racial minority background. So with that understanding of, of these challenges and why this is an important space to investigate, uh, my initial study in this area posed uh, two specific questions. The first being after experiencing racism, what so social support seeking do targets engage in already and what motivates them to do so? And what are the specific opportunities and barriers for the technology that we have right now in regards to supporting uh, people who've experienced racism? Uh, and this uh, investigation takes on an assets-based design approach. Uh, in HCI, we often talk about need finding uh, and understanding what problems a user might be facing and instead, this approach looks at assets. Uh, people who experience racism have a lot of strategies to cope with these things that they're already using to great effect. How can we understand what those assets actually are and center those and bring them into the design process? So in order to investigate those questions with an assets-based approach, I conducted narrative episode interviews with 14 adults who have uh, identified as experiencing racism. Uh, we did hour-long sessions with three parts, the narrative episode, which is a person-centric method that allows people to have as much ag agency and control as possible in an interview context in choosing what they might share uh, with a researcher. Uh, 
uh, followed up by semi-structured interviews um, about some of the topics we knew we cared about, specifically uh, around social and communication technology, uh, and then conducted um, a few surveys um, on those same topics. Uh, this paper was quite long. Um, there's a lot of findings packed into it. And today in this talk, I'm gonna highlight a couple key findings that motivated the, the rest of the work that continued afterwards. Uh, so the first thing I want to share uh, is just the range of stories collected um, during the process. So we asked participants to share as much as they were willing to about their experiences with racism and whatever coping they engaged with afterwards. And across the 14 participants, we collected 52 discrete stories. Discrete stories being stories that had specific context or people involved. Uh, so saying um, someone, um, a person in my lab asked to touch my hair last week would be a specific discrete story, uh, but saying that will comment on my English all the time is not a discrete story, but it is still included in our uh, analysis. Uh, the stories ranged in both practical and perceived intensity, uh, and many of our participants shared uh, stories from childhood. Uh, even though we had prompted them to think about things that had happened in the past two years, uh, those stories from childhood very often stick out prominently, and they're stories that people have already processed and coped with and narrativized to some extent. Uh, so the first result um, I wanted to, to share um, is related to this first question around what is it that's actually getting people to seek support? Uh, so we know that support's important. We know that it's challenging. What is it that pushes them over that edge to reach out to talk to someone about their experiences? Uh, and we found that uncertainty was still central to that emotional experience of racism. Having open-ended questions about those experiences pushes people to, to go out and seek sources uh, where they can resolve those things. Uh, so I'm gonna share a very long quotation from a study participant, but I'll, I'll read it aloud and, and um, highlight a couple of, of important components. Uh, so this story was from a, a participant who described uh, parking his car in his neighborhood. He did this on a regular basis on this hill that overlooked the space. He had a long day and wanted to take a moment to collect his thoughts. Uh, and one of his neighbors called the police on him. And he, uh, the police approached the car in full force with guns drawn. It's a very physically dangerous situation that he was very fortunate to be able to, to leave safely. Uh, but he described all of these questions that he had after the fact. Um, why me? Um, there were so many other people who did the same thing that I did, but no one else ever had the cops called on them. I don't know why it was that this happened. It didn't seem to happen afterwards. He watched that hill for many nights after that fact. Uh, and even more troubling, uh, he found out afterwards as he was exiting that the neighbors who called the police were the neighbors who frequently babysit his daughter. Uh, so he described the story to me more than a year after it had happened, and he still had open-ended questions about why this happened. Um, Again, why me? Why that night? What did I do? And what can I do to continue to keep my family safe? And is my daughter specifically, is she safe with neighbors who enacted racist violence upon me? Uh, so he did engage in a number of different kinds of social meaning making in order to resolve this. Uh, reaching out to, again, someone who is trusted, who is likely to have had similar experiences is a powerful way of resolving that uncertainty. Uh, but it comes with a lot of risks. If you speak to the wrong person, it can create really damaging setbacks to coping, um, uh, uh, specifically in validation by asking a lot of questions about, well, what were you doing? Why were you there? Things like that can be really damaging to that coping process. Uh, so towards the second question, uh, how do social technologies factor into this entire process? I found largely that uh, Participants do not use uh, mainstream social and communication technologies to talk about these issues because there is a very earned mistrust of social platforms. Uh, every participant either had firsthand experience or had a loved one who experienced harm because of discussing their personal experiences with prejudice or bias or racism online. It is emotionally laborious to explain these kinds of stories on a public forum. And it comes with very legitimate risks of things like doxing and harassment. Some participants were concerned that they would lose future job opportunities. Uh, one participant was in law school and said, if I post online that I've experienced racism, uh, future employers might think that I'm biased and that I won't be able to, to process any cases with people of color. Um, and that was a, a very real concern that came from experiences um, of this person's colleagues. 
Uh, so all of all of these um, interviews outlined a couple of specific challenges that we can address through design, uh, specifically that overwhelming uncertainty suffuses all of these experiences with racism. This is one of the main experiences that we need to design for when we're thinking about this space. Uh, and social connection, the specific way that it helps um, is through meaning making, through resolving those uncertainties but it's still a laborious process. It requires a lot of not only emotional labor, but very practical labor and just explaining all of these stories over and over again. Right now, there is a really big gap between audiences. People of color largely feel that social technology is not made for them, at least when it comes to some of these necessary processes to engage with social connection. So with the knowledge of those challenges and some priorities we can think about, uh, we can progress into design work. So this next study I'm going to talk about uses participatory design to bring stakeholders into this process and we're thinking about how to change uh, what social communication technology might look like. Uh, so the first question I wanted to investigate, knowing that uncertainty is core to the experience, is to dive deeper into what that emotional experience actually is and what it might look like. Uh, so to answer that First question, um, I used a uh, interactive vignette study method. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, vignette studies are a method uh, that stem from practice in psychology. Uh, and they're using, um, they use fiction to elicit feelings and perceptions about hypothetical scenarios. Uh, so a, a more classic vignette study might just ask you to read a story and to make some judgments and assertions about a character in the story. Uh, but interactive fiction allows us to do much more complex uh, work when it comes to sensitive topics and vignette studies. Uh, part of the reason this is so effective is because fiction creates this uh, uh, safe psychological distance, right? Even if you're reading a story about something that you might have experienced, you're reading about it from the perspective of another character, someone else who might be experiencing that. And it makes it much more easy to uh, engage with socially complex or um, difficult topics. Uh, so this is a method that is also used in clinical psychology and other sort of therapeutic practice as well as um, experimental psychology. Uh, so interactive fiction uh, deepens vignette studies by taking on a more active role. Uh, instead of just reading a story on paper, you're actually engaging with the story firsthand. Interactive fiction stories are things like Choose Your Own Adventure, where you as the character are deciding what happens next, uh, whether that's through dialogue trees or other kind of more deep um, interactive medium. Uh, and it gives a lot more agency uh, for the person who's experiencing that vignette in deciding what happens next. Uh, so in order to implement these uh, vignettes, I used Twine, which is an open source tool for interactive nonlinear fiction using uh, web programming uh, and some other uh, abilities there. Uh, and uh, previous work has used Twine uh, to create vignette experiments that look at things like iterative decision making. Uh, this tool allows us to give dynamic responses uh, to participants so we can actually lead them along different paths depending on what they're choosing. Uh, we can actually embed measures um, depending on what they select in the story and actually look at that as a form of research data. Uh, so the story uh, that I wrote um, for the study uh, focused on uh, racial microaggressions. Uh, so this vignette follows the story of a college student who experiences a racial microaggression in a meeting uh, the first person perspective allows me to study what it's like to experience racism from a first person perspective without uh, inflicting what I deem to be unnecessary trauma, uh, like a deception study might if we wanted to, again, study these firsthand experiences. Uh, and microaggressions um, are particularly uh, useful to study in this context because of their subtle nature. Microaggressions um, are much smaller instances of racism where, uh, again, there might be unintended uh, harm being caused. So that high degree of uncertainty makes it ideal to, to study this research space. Uh, in the story, um, again, vignette uh, users are able to make their own choices. Uh, they play as the main character, Sam, who is a research assistant in the lab. Uh, some other main characters uh, include Professor Smith, who is the research supervisor for Sam, and Dr. Avery is a visiting professor, uh, and they all have um, sort of just a, a coffee meeting um, where uh, the lab is introduced to Dr. Avery. Uh, so in this vignette, um, there are three racial microaggressions that take place back to back during that introductory meeting. Uh, the three statements are, your English is so good, you're so articulate, and where are you from, where are you really from, where are your parents from? Uh, 
Uh, so again, these forms of racism are often unintended. They're usually said with good intention. Uh, but for those uh, in the space who have heard these before, um, they are uh, alienating uh, forms of racism. Um, so each one of these targets people from specific racial minority groups. So the reason we included three is to have uh, the greatest likelihood of someone who was uh, engaging in the study, uh, recognizing at least one of these or having potentially personally experienced one of these. Uh, so uh, for the measurements of the study, we're recording the decisions people make in the vignettes. Um, how do they respond to uh, this microaggression? Who do they speak to? What do they do afterwards? We also ask some embedded questions in the vignette while they're actually playing through it. So we pause the different moments and ask them to rate how they feel about different characters or how they might be feeling themselves. Uh, and we also conducted a post vignette study that looked at things like immersion, uh, some basic demographic um, so uh, to answer the second question, this uh, is a study that had two parts. Uh, the second question we're interested in is what kinds of design can uh, promote and empower uncertainty reduction as a form of coping? Uh, so to do that, we conducted a uh, foundational fiction uh, participatory design workshop. Uh, so participants who engaged in the study, they did that interactive uh, fiction vignette at home on their own. And then they came into uh, workshop sessions with us in groups uh, following doing that, that at home homework. Uh, so the foundational fiction uh, workshop is a method that I developed with one of my collaborators, Hillary Carey, uh, because while participatory design uh, does have methods for dealing with sensitive topics, there weren't existing methods that precisely did what was needed for this study, which is bringing a group of strangers into a design process for an incredibly personal and sensitive topic, which is of course racism. Uh, so this method um, uses fiction as a jumping off point to uh, have a conversation around experiences with racism. Uh, so when participants come into the workshop, uh, which take place over two hours, they first uh, reconstruct the vignette. So they've all read it at home on their own. They come into the space and they remember key moments. They decide what was important, what happened throughout the story. They then analyze that story over multiple rounds of analysis. They help us find what are the needs for the person in the story? What might, um, what might be needed in this specific experience? Where are some pain points? And where are some opportunities for design? Where can we create tools that might make this experience better for Sam, the character? Uh, and at a certain point, we start opening this up to say, you don't have to just answer this for Sam. Uh, where might this relate to moments in your own life? Where would you like to see technology make these situations easier or better or promote safer and more positive forms of coping? And then finally, they move into ideation spaces where they start uh, actually storyboarding uh, and pitching different ideas for what that technology might look like. Uh, so we conducted six of these workshops with 26 participants from the Pittsburgh area uh, and recruited them by asking whether they had thoughts that they could share about racist interactions. Uh, so these were all, again, people who had uh, self-identified as having experienced racism previously, uh, and the largest representation of this group were people who identified as mixed race individuals. Uh, so again, here what we're measuring is their recall of the narrative. Uh, was it actually meaningful enough for them to remember what happened and what of it did they identify as important? Uh, we analyzed each of those needs, pain points and opportunities, and we did an analysis of their design proposals um, to look at the underlying themes. What features of technology do they highlight as being important to these processes? Um, how feasible are they and are they related to uncertainty, which is the topic that we're interested in studying? Uh, so just to just show you a few examples of these storyboards from participants, here are uh, some of my favorite ones, um, just to give you a, a sense of what they were talking about in the sessions. Um, one of these is a smartwatch button for racism, where you have a little alert on your phone and you click it, um, and really loud alarms go off in the room that you're in, so you can kind of do this covertly to, to signal that something inappropriate is happening in the space. Uh, one person pitched an augmented reality device um, so when you walked around, you could see a person's history of making racist remarks wherever you went. Uh, and the image on the far right um, is a little smart speaker. Uh, that's your friend. When you return home, you can talk about your experiences. Uh, and it tells you, it's not your fault. How can I help make you feel better? Uh, and it has an essential oil diffuser and it's able to play music. So it's a, a really fun device. 
Um, so to analyze all of these, we did an inductive thematic data analysis. This is just a picture of me doing this analysis in person in February, right before we started going on quarantine. And then eventually I had to translate all of this to a Miro board to do online collaborative analysis, um, which was an interesting challenge that um, actually worked out really well. Uh, so here's a list of all of the themes that came up when we were looking at all of these design proposals. Of course, these are far more than I could possibly talk about today. Um, so I just, again, want to highlight a few that are important to the final study and design work that I'm going to be presenting at the end. So the first theme uh, focused on, um, again, this connection to uncertainty. Uh, specifically, this theme highlighted the importance of validation in these processes, and it aligns with that prior work that shows that uncertainty and meaning making are critical to this coping process. Uh, so what this theme adds to that conversation is this idea that reducing uncertainty is not just for the person who is targeted by an experience um, of interpersonal racism, but it's also for everyone else in the space. Uh, it's, it's important to, again, for participants to convey the sense that um, their feelings about this process aren't enough, that they need to call on some kind of authoritative figure, in this case, data, that is able to, to validate their experiences. Uh, so to just share a couple of quotations from participants, uh, we had one participant who said, Siri's listening all the time anyways, it would be cool if she also listened for racist things. Uh, and another participant followed up and said, yeah, then maybe she could say something. She could speak up for you and say, hey, that was racist. She'll add it to her file on you and say like, hey, did you notice that you only ask certain types of students where they're from? Uh, and again, what this is proposing is um, uh, not just this technology, but it also conveys this perception of my participants, which is that they think that their technology is already always listening and recording, regardless of their consent. And they propose a future where that data is actually being used uh, for their own uh, good and for something that's actually useful for them. Uh, other participants proposed, again, creating files on people, assessing language uh, to calculate the likelihood of future racism. And I'll, I'm, I'll talk about this more in depth later, but I will say right now, um, my proposal is not that we ever implement these things. There are a lot of considerations going on here. Instead, they're, they're highlighting interesting things about what participants perceive their needs to be. This next theme takes that a step further and it says, once you know that something's happening, once the idea that something racist is happening, what do you actually do? What steps do you take to protect yourself or take care of yourself or take care of others in that moment? Uh, and a lot of the designs that were proposed in this space represent the first part of what is referred to as an ouch oops protocol. An ouch oops protocol is one where the person who is harmed uh, has to acknowledge that harm out loud it stops the conversations this is something that is used in discussion spaces uh, and acknowledge that they've been harmed. And it gives space for the person who enacted the harm to pause, acknowledge that they did wrong and apologize. Uh, so you can see there are a lot of examples of what that might look like here on the room. Again, some of these are very practical. Some of them are very silly and fantastical and it's something that we would never want to see in, in actual practical reality. But there was this desire expressed through these for technology to take on that role. It's incredibly, um, it creates a lot of vulnerability to step up and say, hey, that was inappropriate or that hurt me, or that was something that was incredibly prejudiced to say. It's, it's risky to call that out when it's happening. Uh, so participants proposed technologies that could take on that vulnerability and that heat and remove the focus and the burden from targets from always having to not only experience these difficult situations, but then also do all of the work to unpack that in a given space. And the final theme I want to focus on today uh, is a bit of a different, uh, totally different perspective on what it might look like to cope with these processes. And instead, it looks at comfort. Uh, it looks at the emotional side of that experience. Uh, participants expressed um, that, again, the emotional experience of uncertainty is anxiety inducing and overwhelming. And what might it look like for my technology to prioritize my well being in that way when it comes to these experiences? So again, I just want to highlight a conversation that happened between participants in the second workshop as they were finalizing their, <clears throat> their ideas. Uh, so one participant proposed that you could have an app that you talk to, it listens to all of your unfiltered thoughts, and it reflects back why someone did something. It can open a recording, you can let out your emotions, and then you can delete everything afterwards so it goes away. It's just for the catharsis of it. And another participant iterated on that and said, yeah, you could have an AI that knows exactly what to say to comfort you depending on your personality, or it might just let you rant. Uh, 
And a third participant followed up and said, it could be catered to you no matter the situation, it emulates actual friendship. Uh, so through this workshop, we found a couple of, of, again, interesting findings that contribute to this space of anti-racist technology design. Uh, first is just a methodological contribution. The foundational fix shop a fiction workshop was incredibly effective in facilitating conversations uh, around um, future speculative design in a space that is incredibly potentially sensitive and vulnerable for participants. Uh, it creates a space that uh, is open for vulnerability, again, using that psychological distancing of the fiction, uh, but then creating moments of validation uh, for participants as they discuss the meaning of those stories and what they took away from it. Uh, this study also contributes some knowledge towards uh, what is commonplace understanding of modern technology. Participants expressed a number of perspectives on what their technology is already actively doing and how it is either prioritizing their well-being or how it is uh, harming their well-being. A lot of that um, rich perspective um, that you can read more in the paper. Uh, and finally, it highlights considerations and themes in designing technology that can empower uh, coping with uncertainty from interpersonal racism. Uh, specifically, it highlights uh, themes um, around complex understanding of how technology can amplify and enact oppression. Uh, but again, as I, I hinted at earlier, these proposals are not solutions. Um, they represent an ongoing and public discussion around different kinds of technologies, uh, but they don't necessarily take those ideas and put them in context. So these are what are known as naive, fragile fictions. They help us highlight really interesting trends and themes and perspectives, but because they haven't been evaluated in context, uh, they are not uh, solutions to actually be implemented. So the workshop told us uh, priorities and themes, uh, and the final study I'm gonna share with you today uh, shows us um, what it might look like to actually see these in context. So for this final study, we move uh, more deeply into design work uh, and take on a prototyping approach. Uh, if you're not familiar with prototypes, uh, they are provocative prototypes. Uh, again, the goal here is not to make something that should actually be uh, created in the wild, but it's to make some kind of actual tangible artifact that illuminates the tensions and contradictions within a given practice. Uh, and it allows us to, again, place these ideas and put them in actual context and see what happens uh, when you put them in context. So it has roots in uh, critical design and critique, uh, but also moves us into a generative space where we're actually making something um, and understanding what that might look like. Uh, so for this final study, I, again, uh, used the foundational fiction vignette to actually put uh, those uh, design themes in context. Um, so I rewrote the story and instead in that moment when they experienced the racial microaggression, uh, participants have a chance to use the technologies that were proposed um, in those storyboarding uh, earlier. Uh, so at the very beginning of the story, they see this additional uh, uh, priming that in the story, they'll have a chance to encounter a futuristic fictional technology. Um, so in the story, we give participants the chance to use or not use the technology. They're not forced to, that's up to them. Uh, we also give them many different options of how they might use it. Uh, so I'm gonna describe the three uh, prototypes. So there was um, uh, many rounds of iteration and filtering that we used to, to reduce down which um, of the storyboards we wanted to move forward. Uh, that included evaluating whether or not, again, they directly addressed uncertainty, uh, whether they were practical to write into the vignettes, um, and whether or not they would tell us something different about um, how participants experience uh, racism and uncertainty. Uh, so the first prototype is the racism alarm. The racism alarm uh, combines multiple proposals and it embodies that theme around data validation and intervention in the moments. Uh, it also serves some teaching purpose to people who are perpetrating the uh, racist interaction. Uh, so it detects racist speech in public spaces. Uh, when the racism alarm hears someone say something racist, it blares really loudly in the space. Uh, and it can only be shut off when the person who tripped it leans forward into the microphone and says, I'm sorry. It then silences and it prints out a strip of paper with contextual information about the offense. Uh, the second prototype um, is a little bit more subtle. Uh, the smartwatch ally uh, embodies the data validation theme, but it also helps uh, more practically with what you should do afterwards and how you might respond. Uh, 
Uh, so the smartwatch ally is uh, described as measuring stress signals such as your pulse and uh, your voice. Uh, and it offers advice for how to respond in the moment uh, to a racist experience. So it's described as being uh, particularly designed for uh, instances of prejudice, including racism, sexism, or homophobia. Uh, it offers to record the conversation once it's been tripped. It offers to call your phone with a fake phone call if you want to exit the situation and step away. Um, and it also offers to ping potential allies in the space um, who might step in for you. It can also give you advice about how you might respond verbally uh, to this experience. And the final prototype, the comfort speaker, uh, embodies that uh, final comfort theme that I discussed. Uh, it's meant to be an advanced smart speaker, similar to the storyboard that I showed earlier, whose purpose is to help with stress. So it has customizable personality settings. Uh, it allows you to vent. It offers to be a listening ear. It can text or call people for you. It can play music, release your favorite scent or set lighting in the room. Um, so all of the different, again, proposals that we heard around uh, designs that uh, uh, prioritize comfort. So in order to evaluate these three prototypes, uh, we asked three questions. First, uh, is this method of putting prototypes in an interactive vignette even effective? Can people meaningfully understand and evaluate the designs that they're seeing in the story? Uh, if that is true, uh, how do those designs impact people's perception of racism in the conversation? Uh, and finally, how do the designs impact people's emotional experience of the conversation? Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we embedded uh, those prototypes in the vignette uh, and evaluated this with 42 adults from the United States using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Uh, and the study has three conditions, one for the alarm, one for the watch, and one for the speaker. Uh, so this is a between subjects design. So participants only saw uh, one of the, um, the prototypes. Uh, and again, we again ran the vignette with all of its embedded questions and did a post vignette uh, evaluative survey. Uh, the post vignette evaluative survey had a couple of components. Uh, the first was just uh, soliciting design feedback from the participants. Uh, what did they like about it? Could they describe what it actually does? What's their likelihood of actually using it if it were to actually exist? Uh, we assessed their perception of racism. So we asked um, a number of different impression questions of those specific characters in the story, um, as well as some, some grounding questions. So for example, what is your impression of Dr. Avery? And on a scale of one to seven, do you believe that Dr. Uh, Avery's comments at the cafe demonstrate racial bias? Uh, and then we also ask questions around their emotional experience. What emotions do they think uh, the main character, Sam, experienced during that conversation at the cafe? On a scale of one to seven, how strongly would you rate that they felt those emotions? Uh, and all of these questions come from previous research um, we did in this space. Those uh, emotions came from some surveys we had done earlier to understand what the, the main emotions people typically feel during experiences with racism. Uh, so this was largely, um, uh, it was a mix of qualitative and quantitative data analysis for those open response uh, fields, such as what was your impression of this uh, character? We did inductive thematic analysis and evaluative coding, and then did some non-parametric tests for the quantitative <laughs> questions. Uh, so uh, towards that first question again, can they actually meaningfully understand these? Uh, yes, they can. It's actually uh, pretty effective. Uh, so for example, um, uh, the participants describing the watch said, the watch is an app. It evaluates your pulse and possibly your voice to detect your emotions. And then it sends you some advice when you're in awkward or stressful situations. Uh, to describe the speaker, one participant said, the speaker's purpose is to relax and calm people down by removing their stress. I think it would be nice to vent and feel like there is someone who's actually listening to what you have to say. Um, so describing quite a lot of detail about what the actual features of these are um, and also responding a little bit to what they, they like and didn't like about it. Uh, so what are their actual impressions of these designs? Um, how do participants feel about each of these? Uh, largely participants really hated the racism alarm. Uh, they felt that the racism alarm created a really socially awkward situation, that it actually made them more vulnerable in those spaces and that they had absolutely no agency when it came to that. They weren't able to actually say when they wanted it to trip or when they didn't, it was just putting them in a really difficult situation. Uh, so one participant says, I liked nothing. I think the alarm is way too sensitive. And it made the person feel uncomfortable where he wasn't initially. So they didn't even think that Sam in that experience was experiencing racism that was noticeable. Uh, 
Another person said, I would not want to create a scene. And a third participant said, I would eliminate this from existence. Uh, and it's important to note, we did not make this the racism alarm up. These are direct adaptations from multiple participants in the study. And again, you can see um, it's putting it in context reveals some of the, the tensions between what might be wanted and what works um, practically. Uh, responses to the smartwatch ally were a bit more positive. They felt that it was useful, but that it was distracting. Uh, there was a focus on helping with that emotionally uh, difficult part of the experience, but there was a desire for even more agency when it comes to using this. They still felt like it was going to be awkward, that people might notice that you were using the alarm and they would be offended that your watch called them racist because it's your device and you're responsible for what it does. Um, so they said, um, it could be really helpful in determining my own emotions. Maybe I don't know that I'm stressed, but having my watch tell me I'm stressed might help me understand why my heart rate is elevated or why I'm sweating. Uh, another person said, it confirms that the other person's being inappropriate, not that you are being too sensitive. So again, aligning with some of those. Um, uh, but again, this third participant mentioned, I would change the buzzing. It feels like it's awkward. It's a loud telltale sign. I would want it to be silent and to just update me afterwards. And then finally, responses to the comfort speaker were incredibly positive. Uh, people felt that it was relaxing, it was a good listener, um, and it gave them a lot of agency for when and how to actually interact with it. So we have comments like, I like that it made me feel relaxed um, you know, by infusing my favorite scent. Uh, they like that it wasn't overly imposing or dictatorial. And a lot of the feedback said there isn't anything that they would change about it. A lot of participants spent some time pitching additional features that it might have, but there wasn't anything about what it was currently doing that they wanted to alter. Uh, and towards the second question, uh, how did the designs impact people's perception of racism? Uh, uh, a couple of interesting responses to this. So um, we did an evaluative coding um, of that data on the impression uh, and found that, um, uh, so we use Professor Smith as this useful foil for comparison because people don't tend to say that he was racist. And here we might expect participants to indicate that Dr. Avery is prejudiced the most in the alarm condition, uh, but that wasn't necessarily the case. They weren't necessarily willing to make a strong assessment about her character, uh, again, because of the subtle nature of microaggressions. Uh, there is a resistance to calling someone racist who might have said something unintentionally uh, biased. Uh, and it turns out that explicitly calling out racism doesn't increase certainty. So one of the goals of these designs was to make people feel uh, more sure about the nature of an experience. And instead we found that in every design condition, participants significantly more strongly agreed that Dr. Avery was racist, racist compared to Professor Smith, but there was no difference across the designs for how they evaluated um, uh, both of these characters. Uh, so again, uh, you know, through a one-way ANOVA, we found there was uh, no strong difference uh, here. Um, and instead, um, calling out uh, explicit racism with the alarm uh, seemed to have a, a backfiring uh, 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 reaction. Uh, and instead, again, the watch seemed to do a much better job at signaling to people that the comments were inappropriate without um, overly placing an uh, interpretation on that. Uh, so I'm now running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to just really briefly comment on the emotional experience. Uh, so um, we did find that um, the emotional experience of each of these prototypes was very different. Uh, so we're able to code these into uh, a valence and arousal mapping of emotions. So these are all the emotions that were listed to participants about how they might have felt at different moments in the story. Uh, and largely felt, saw that um, alarm participants uh, felt really negative emotions with uh, mixed levels of arousal or activation of their emotions. Uh, watch participants felt negative emotions with high arousal and a little bit of positive ones. Um, we were a bit surprised to see so many negative uh, emotions during uh, the watch uh, prototype. Uh, and then finally, the speaker uh, tended to create more positive emotional experiences with again, mixed levels of arousal. Uh, so I'm going to um, kind of quickly move through the rest of these. I, I'm happy to answer more questions about this afterwards, because um, I want to get to a little bit of, of where I'm headed with some of this work in the future. Um, so again, found that this method was effective in uh, uh, demonstrating these prototypes and letting people actually use them. It helped us evaluate them and find out really interesting tensions in the design of these technologies, even while actually doing things that uh, similar participants had asked for. But again, we found new priorities such as agency when it comes to this type of technology.
Uh, so I want to spend the last uh, couple of minutes really quickly just talking about um, where I see this work fitting into a larger HCI context and where I hope it goes in the future. Uh, so first, uh, this work contributes uh, to these ongoing conversations in the digital humanities and in ethnic and cultural studies and information studies around how race suffuses our interactions and the construction of our technology. Uh, and this brings a specifically HCI perspective to those conversations. Uh, this work also demonstrates the ability of games and interactive narrative as a tool to facilitate conversations around things that are incredibly sensitive. Uh, this work also directly contributes to HCI. Uh, it demonstrates some specific considerations in the design of games and other social technology in creating anti-racist technology. It shows how, um, again, games can be a specific part of that the role of uncertainty in all of these experiences, and it contributes specific knowledge about how uh, Black and Indigenous people of color experience racism and cope with it in CSCW relevant contexts. This work presents methodological contributions for participatory design, for research and design methods, uh, for game design methods, and uh, the design and evaluation of uh, design prototypes. Um, finally, uh, as many of you know, um, I wrote a Kai paper this past year with my co-first authors, Angela and Finda. And while it's not a part of this body of research, uh, this research informed very much how I approached this work on critical race theory for HCI. Um, it, my work tackles a very specific understanding of race, but there is a lot of room and a, a gigantic open agenda for other scholars to engage um, in this kind of work uh, within the field of HCI. Uh, as I'm thinking about where I want to see this moving forward, I wanted to share this quotation from Andre Brock Jr. in uh, his book, Distributed Blackness. And I wanted to take this moment to, to reflect on, on this body of my work. Um, and Andre writes about how focusing on racism as a frame for black identity is deterministic, right? It's important for us um, to understand marginalization. I think that there is incredible power in understanding how oppression is enacted so we can uncover those dynamics and how we might resist them. That being said, focusing solely on trauma experiences or marginalizing and oppressive experiences as the experience of being a person of color, I think is overly deterministic. It's not the only thing that we should be studying when it comes to race and technology. Uh, so much of my future work is moving in that direction, moving away from just focusing on oppression, marginalization, and instead centering uh, experiences of joy. Um, how can we use games to deliver joyful experiences that might uh, address oppression or might be there to just uplift and empower people of color? Um, I'm going to be extending my work on these participatory design workshops in that direction and finding other ways to incorporate frameworks of joy and cultural wealth into my anti-racist work. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll wrap things up. I wanted to just say that um, this work is done with uh, an incredibly large amount of really wonderful collaborators and scholars uh, without whom I would absolutely not be able to do this. I was able to work with, I believe over 40 students over the course of all of this work um, who were just really incredible collaborators. Uh, so with that, I thank you for being here and I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Silent claps. Um, <laughs> while folks are queuing up, one that I was wondering about, um, you, at, at one point in your talk, you said, these are not solutions. You use the phrase that they're like naive, fragile fictions, um, okay. which makes a lot of sense. Uh, so of course the sort of, the place where my head went from there was, okay, so if those aren't solutions, um, and then there's the, of course, the broader effort of, you know, deconstructing racism, uh, but like, if we know that's not the right angle, and we know that we already need to be doing the sort of societal level work, where can we as designers of technologies we, I don't think we'd ever call anything a solution, but like, where would that live? What might it look like? Um, and this could just be a hunch. I'm not asking for like pointing at a specific thing and saying, well, that's the, the closest thing I've seen, but you know, what characteristics might it have? How can I, as um, someone who, who wants to learn from your expertise in this space uh, say, 
like, look at it have and say, oh, that's definitely a fragile versus this feels more like a, a solution? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I mean, I think to me, it just, it just means engaging with this in a much longer process, right? So I, I wanted to start out with um, asking participants to, to build naive fragile fictions because I view this as a space that's really, I thought we could start from a space that was like really blue sky. What, what would it look like if your, if your world of technology was better or more empowered? So I think that that's, I think that's a really powerful frame to start from, but right where uh, in respecting participants, that's understand like they are an expert in a lot, lot of things that I'm not an expert in, right? They're an expert in their own experiences and what they need. Um, and I think that that's, you know, calling it a naive fragile fiction maybe is, is obfuscating some of that, right? There's a lot of power in the designs that were proposed. But what these participants are not experts in is like actually building some of these technologies um, and actually deploying them in a real world scenario, right? They're able to picture what would it look like if I um, had a better experience when it came to these things, but like putting that in a living, breathing social world where uh, a lot of factors are coming into play is really difficult. So I mean, I think the prototype work is moving in that direction, right? It's like once you can imagine like taking all that feedback I got from that evaluation study and using it to iterate something that you actually might want to build in practice. Um, and that uh, took a lot of those themes and put them into something practical. But I specifically chose things that were incredibly exaggerated to try to find out where those boundaries were. Cause it's, again, it's such an open space that we need to, to start just very slowly narrowing in on that. Um, so I think that's entirely possible to like do the type of work I did with the prototypes, but try to make something that you would actually want to see. Um, that was just a, a methodological choice I made because there's a lot of room for innovation here. And I wanted to just see like, what would it look like to, to choose some of these ideas that are a little bit more exaggerated. Thanks. Yeah, I'm thinking about what it means to design technologies for allyship, for example. Um, Cindy, you had a, a question? Hi, Alexandra. Uh, good to see you again. Hi. <laughs> Seems like you've been extremely productive since I've seen you last. This is amazing work. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got a whole PhD. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was curious. Uh, I thought this was really exciting thinking about how you could think about physical kind of co-located interactions, thinking about how you might lead people through these design exercises. Uh, I think there's a lot of assumptions there about shared visibility of the information being presented to people that played into there are things were um, acceptable solutions or acceptable ideations around interventions. Um, what do you think would be some of the things that would transfer or challenges to taking these to online settings, uh, you know, uh, online communities, chat sort of situations um, where you may not have the same assumptions that the same information is being presented to all sides or same visibility into what's happening? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, building that trust and making it a space that is actually safe, whatever that might look like for the participants was a huge part of the consideration in, in developing that, that participatory design method. Um, so yeah, when we were in person, um, even entering that space, knowing that we're all interested in anti-racist design, things like that, you can still see like participants were really tentative to engage with each other in the very beginning. And that process of reconstructing the narrative gave them the chance to validate each other, even if that's what we were calling it in name. And I do think that a lot of that would transfer to an online context, right? Like, I mean, they were, had the ability to physically reconstruct it. They all had pads of sticky notes with different colors to like build up these layers of like what the story is and what's actually happening here. I, I don't think that would be that difficult to translate online and like seeing what other people noticed in the story was really important because like we never actually tell them as the researchers like, I mean, we don't like highlight what moment was racist, but when they start telling each other that they noticed that, it's that's the moment where you see this really big shift in the conversation. So, so I actually think that that would translate pretty nicely. Um, in terms of the specific dynamics that happened in the room, a lot of that is work that's on the facilitator, like myself and my collaborator, um, Hillary, we ran all the workshops together. And we, we write about that a little bit more in this uh, disc whip that we published on this method. But a lot of it is really being transparent about what our role is, right? So it's like the same thing that you do in a, a typical HCI user study, right? Where you need to explain, like, we're not evaluating here. That's not the point here. The point is that you're an expert and I have a lot to gain from your expertise. Let's collaborate and work on this together. Um, so that's more of like an attitudinal thing about how I approach my work. Um, I try to maintain some transparency and communication with my participants. Um, the participants I interviewed in the very first study I shared I interviewed them in 2018. 
And I sent them all an email two weeks ago that was like, hey, the work that we did together, I don't know if you remember me, but the work that we did together when you spent an hour with me talking about some of your most vulnerable experiences, it's published now. And it was given a best paper award and you should feel extraordinarily proud that I think that the stories that you share are really impacting people who think about technology. Um, so a lot of that is just in the, the relationship building that I have with my participants. So it's some of the work that they're doing with each other, but a lot of it's in the framing of, of how I'm trying to communicate what my work is for and, and who it's for. All right, well, then I get to, I get to ask my question. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking about how we teach HCI in design. Um, we've, as you mentioned, sort of take often this, you know, human-centered perspective. We're starting with, you know, identify stakeholders, need finding, et cetera. Um, and this often centers the power of the designer in the process. Um, so HCI has developed a bunch of alternative methods that try to either be more participatory or not center the designer in their, in their sort of structural position quite so much. I guess what I would love to get your take on is having done all of this work, um, what should stay about how we teach design and what should change? You know, if, if you were to write Alexandra's intro to HCI textbook, what, what would be most noticeably different? And essentially how should we be teaching ourselves, you know, here CS 147 or it's follow ons 247, et cetera at, at Stanford? Yeah, that's a really great question. It's, it's funny you ask, like so I mentioned in our institution at Northeastern, trying to encourage more reflexive practice, right? I, I'm asking, do they consider their expertise to be? What do you consider your responsibility to be um, when it comes to your design work and your, your, your research work? Um, can you reflect on like all of the things that you bring to the table when you're entering a design space with a stakeholder. Um, so mostly I'm just trying to get people to reflect on their positions in the world and how they relate to other people and what kinds of commitments they want to make to the communities that they're doing work for. Um, so I think being really persistent with that um, is the thing that I'm the most interested in encouraging people to do because I think what follows from that is a lot of other kinds of ethical practice and a lot of other considerations but starting from understanding like what your actual roles and responsibilities are and, and the space that you occupy in relation to other people I think that is a really important starting ground for those conversations. 